Now let us judge the right of a wife to seek divorce and to remarry as per Islam, Christianity and Hinduism. It is stated in chapter 5 verse 154 of Manusmadi. Vishila kama vrtova gunairva parivarjida upacharya striya sadhya sadadam devavat padihi. That even if the husband leads an immoral and adulterous life and is without any good qualities, still a chaste wife should consider him as God. In the light of the ever verse, how can a Hindu woman as per their scriptures have freedom? How can she question the injustice perpetrated against her? How can she free herself from the bondage of ill-fated marriage by divorcing her evil husband? Even after the death of her husband, who has treated her cruelly, she has no chance of escape because chapter 9, verse 65 of Manusmudi says, No dohi keshu mandreshu niyoga kirtya de kochit na vivaha vitha vuktam vitava vedanam puna. Nothing is stated in the books that deals with marriage about the remarriage of a widow. And Manu also stipulate the kind of life a widow should lead. In chapter 5, verse 157 of Manu Smudi, it is stated, Kamam tuk shabe deham pushpamula bhale shubai, nadu namabi grihniyat patyau prede parasyadu. Widow should only eat pure flowers, fruits, etc. and should make their body lean and should not even think about remarriage. As a matter of fact, the life of a Hindu widow was worse than death. In earlier periods when child marriages were so common, just imagine the pathetic plight of young widows, aged eight and nine years, eating only once a day, with their heads shaved and living in dark isolated rooms with no freedom to remarry or even to dream about that. There is a universal practice among Hindus even today to see good sights in the morning. The sight of a widow is considered as a bad omen, so they will avoid seeing the sight of a widow at early mornings, as well as on all auspicious occasions like marriages, etc. Vedas also sanctioned Sadiprada. Widow was burned in the funeral pyre of her husband on the basis of the belief that she will remain his slave, birth after birth, and may never be released from the bonds of slavery. This evil practice called Sadi was very prevalent till 19th century and is still conducted even though very rarely. If this was the attitude of the Hindu scriptures towards a wife, the attitude towards the husband was just the opposite. If a wife who loses her husband is to lead a life of an animal, without proper food, without dignity, without the thought of remarriage, or even compelled to commit suicide by jumping into the funeral pyre of her husband, Manu on the contrary directs the husband as per verse 168 of chapter 5 in Manu Smriti as follows. A husband whose wife is dead shall light the funeral pyre of his wife and has to marry immediately and then only he needs to complete the funeral ceremony of his deceased wife. Bible also denies women the right to divorce and remarry as can be seen from verse 32, chapter 5 of the Gospel of Matthew. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except for sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. The same idea is expressed by Paul in verse 2 chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians. If she departs, let her remain unmarried. From the above verses it can be seen that remarriage of a widow is prohibited according to the teachings of Christianity. Verses 26 and 33, chapter 14 of the Gospel of Luke, give a quite interesting observation. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, and wife and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. These verses of Bible surely give the impression that in order to become a true follower of Jesus Christ, one has to abandon his wife. In short, as the Bible, a woman is supposed to live a life of total subjugation to man, without any right to speak against injustice and cruelty, without the right to divorce and remarry. Moreover, in case a husband wants to be a true follower of Jesus Christ, he has to discard his wife also. So the threat of abandonment by her husband always hangs over her head like the sword of Damocles. If as per the Hindu and the Christian scriptures, a wife is not entitled to question the cruel behavior of her husband or liberate herself through divorce, even if he is extremely wicked and evil. The attitude of the noble Quran is just the opposite. 
The Quran says in chapter 2, verse 229 as follows. فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا يُكِيمَا حُدُودَ اللَّهِ فَلَا جُنَاهَ أَلَيْهِمَا فِي مَفْتَدَةَ بِهِ If judges indeed fear that they, that is the spouses, would be unable to keep the limits ordained by Allah, there is no blame on either of them if she gives something for her freedom. As per this verse, if a wife feels that she cannot live with her husband due to some genuine reasons, then she can seek divorce after paying back the mahar or dower that has been received from him. Once a woman approached the Prophet wasallam and said, My husband behaves well, but his appearance is not at all appealing to me, and it is difficult for me to continue in marital bond. The Prophet wasallam permitted her to divorce after returning the mahar that is dower. She has received from her husband. Verse 128 of chapter 4 of the Quran states, If a wife fears cruelty or desertion on her husband's part. There is no blame on them if they arrange an amicable settlement between themselves, and such settlement is best, even though men's souls are swayed by greed. But if you do good and practice self-restraint, Allah is well acquainted with all that you do. So Islam allows spouses to get separated on amicable grounds on the basis of settlement. In fact, this is the most practical approach in most of the modern legal systems in many countries, divorce is granted only if certain grounds stated in the statutes are substantiated by the parties seeking divorce. The lawyers appearing in such cases often resort to concocted stories and allegations maligning the character of the other party in order to substantiate their arguments. The party seeking divorce tends to accuse the other of having extramarital sexual relations or of being a sexual pervert, etc. Those petitions, once filed in courts, become public documents and anyone can get copies of them and make them public. Moreover, the ordeal of facing cross-examination is really humiliating and upsetting. As a result of grueling cross-examinations, several persons have had to undergo treatment for mental depression. After prolonged litigations, the courts may grant divorce. In some cases, permission for divorce may be refused. In cases where the court refuses to grant divorce, the plight of the spouses remains pitiable. They are unable to marry since the early marriage is subsisting. Even in cases where the courts grants divorce, the character of the parties is so maligned that they would face difficulty in finding partners of their choice and liking. Even if they are able to remarry, they, their new partners might entertain doubts about their character. Viewed in this perspective, Islam's approach towards divorce is quite pragmatic. If a husband and wife finds it difficult to continue their marriage, they should come to an amicable settlement and get separated, so that each of them can seek to pursue life through other means that are permitted by Islam. As per Islamic scholars, woman is also entitled to get divorced if she had not given her prior consent for their marriage, if her husband behaves cruelly towards her, if he does not treat her in a just and decent manner, if he does not consider her equally with his other wives, if he takes the property belonging to her, if her husband is sexually impotent or has contracted venereal diseases, if he takes another wife without her permission provided, such a demand that had been made and accepted as a part of the marriage contract, etc. In such circumstances, there is no need to give back the dower as the termination of the marriage contract is because of the fault of the husband and not of the wife. The Quran also advised man to see the positive aspects of the character of wives and not the negative aspects so that divorce can be avoided. The Quran says in chapter 4 verse 19 as follows, فَإِن كَرِهْتُمُهُنَّ فَأَسَا أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَيَجَئَلَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا If you take a dislike to them, it may be that. You dislike a thing and Allah brings about through it a great deal of good. In a hadith, which is not authoritative according to some scholars, is saying, is attributed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as follows, Abu Ghalul halali lallahi tawlaq, the most detestable among the permissible matters in the sight of Allah, is divorce. In short, the right to divorce that is denied to woman in the scriptures of Hinduism and Christianity is granted to woman by the noble Quran as a last resort. Islam shows concern towards the woman who has been divorced